Hello, I'm Fiona Sitkin, um, a founder and a host of The Bridge for Women Worldwide. I am now hosting the second episode of The Bridge talk show series. And the topic of today's episode is uh, Women Worldwide on the Rise, American English with an Accent. Um, the host today is Fiona Sipkin, myself, of course, and we'll have two guests, Deborah Levine and Irmgard Lafrenz. We are proud to be a by women, for women talk show because we want to engage women worldwide and relevant to their lives conversations in front of the gender diverse audience. We persist pushing for women's rights, causes, and movements. And today, uh, we focus on two topics. Number one, current events on domestic violence, where Irgard Lafrance will help me, and interview and discussion about American English with an accent, where Deborah Levine will help me. Uh, our talk show is partially based on my HuffPost blogs and the recent book called How They Made It in America, Success Stories and Strategies of Immigrant Women from Isabella Leander to Ivana Trump to fashion designer Josie Natori plus more. And today we'll have also the honor to interview Deborah Levine, one of my 18 prominent book subjects, and Irmgard Lafrenz, who also is one of my uh, prominent book subjects. So um, let us start with the current events first. The current events are about domestic violence. And as I mentioned, Irmgard Lafrenz is helping me on that. Irmgard spent three years as a volunteer in Cuenca, Ecuador, working for the foundation called Casa Maria Amor, a shelter for abused women and children in Cuenca. We will discuss several interesting issues here, and I believe Irmgard knows much more than I do about the issues. These are the four issues. Uh, domestic violence increases due to pandemic. And indeed, this is what we read from multiple, multiple media outlets. This is why we want to bring this up. First, more than half of the world population on the pandemic lockdown, we know that domestic violence is increasing, both in the USA and around the world. Clearly, some self-isolated people, the men, suffer a lot from self-isolation, from boredom, and from financial troubles, and this provokes aggression in them as abusive types. So their women must bear the burden of it, including severe beatings. I am just wondering why the victimized women do not escape. What do you think, Yangard? Yeah, in general, you can say they are scared, insecure, and financially dependent. Uh -huh. So they lost their self-confidence through years of abuse. Typically their husbands, uh, fathers, brothers, or uncles are the abusers. And the unknown is completely scary for them. I see. So instead of leaving, they endure sexual, physical, and emotional abuse. 
And now the COVID-19 pandemic makes this even worse for them. I am sure, I am sure. Um, could you share with us, Irgard, how Foundation Casa Maria Amor works? I heard they have a very large effort all around Ecuador. Yes, uh, they do. Uh, typically, the abuse happens in rural areas or small villages and small towns. The women are young, uh -huh. poor, uneducated, and with no support. Uh -huh. The cycle is very hard to break because their mothers have been abused themselves, so they won't help their daughters. Uh, Casa Maria Amor started as a grassroots network and has grown now and even has a hotline. So if women decide to leave, they can call the hotline and one of the social workers will pick them up. Now, this is certainly not e as easy as uh, we think because the women will certainly not leave without their children. Uh, so okay. they have to more or less escape. And the way they do it is either at night when their husbands or their abusers are drunk and passed out or during the day when he is working and out of the house. Mm -hmm. So they have to leave without anything. So the social worker picks them up at a prearranged location, typically a church or the a house of a midwife, some trusted person. Mm -hmm. And again, they have nothing on them. They can't walk away with a suitcase. Uh -huh. So they will be brought to Casa Maria Amor, which is basically a safe house above uh, Cuenca in the mount mountains. And there they get the essentials, clothes, toiletries, and a private room. Uh -huh. The main thing is that they need to be made safe because safety is the key issue. Because again, as I said earlier, they are scared. They are uh -huh. very, very scared. So once they decide to stay at the shelter, typically for six to 10 months, they get training, work training, therapy. Their children uh, uh, go to school. Near the shelter is a school. So they can start figuring out their new life. Uh -huh. And at the end, once they decide to leave, they can decide where they want to go. Typically, we encourage them to leave the province, so to get out of the reach of the abuser. And most likely, they will have found a friend or a uh, relative who takes them in and helps them with the next step. Mm -hmm. or Maria Amor has a network and refers them to the next uh, a network to, to help them the to the next step. I see, I see. You know so very much. It's so informative. Everything you said is very, very informative. Um, let me share something about the United States situation. As reported by NBC News, Throughout our country, the recorded reports of domestic violence are increasing. And uh, the domestic abuse cases are growing tremendously. Like in March, there were many more reported than in February, in April more than in March, in May more than in April, and so on and so forth. For example, Houston, Texas saw an increase of more than 300 reported cases per month. And Charlotte, North Carolina is even worse. More than 500 more reported cases per month. That's a huge spike, right? 
Yes, indeed. And I hear this uh, from uh, Ecuador as well. So I get reports uh, from Casa Maria Amor that confirms uh, what you are saying uh, as well. And I mean, the answer to this is strictly we need more training for men. We need to be much more proactive. And this is worldwide. We need to be more uh, uh, proactive training and educating men that it's not okay to beat up their women. And uh, giving that the second wave is most likely coming or already here makes this even more important. I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you because from what we learn from media, global rates of domestic violence are also on the rise worldwide. Do you know, by the way, that France and Spain have adopted a very special system so the victims can secretly report their abuse? Did you hear about that? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, is, and I love their system. Yes. I love their system. Yes. Like the victims go to, to pharmacy and say a coded word. Yes. Mask 19, and then the help comes. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, this is a great, great way to do it. Uh, and uh, I do know about the Violence Against uh, Women Act 1994. Uh, but again, we need to do much, much more. And my mantra is we have to break the cycle of violence. Right. The cycle of violence needs to be broken. And for me, that is the key issue. And at Casa Maria Amor, we are working on this because the education and therapy for boys is crucial to break this cycle because these boys don't see anything else but violence against women and they may become the next generation abuser. So my thing is, I really, really hope we can manage to break the cycle uh, in, with education, training, and therapy. I cannot agree more with you, Irbert, with all my heart. Of course, legislation is a good thing, very good, but systemic education of boys works from the grassroots. That's what's really going to work. Yes. Now, yeah, let me make a point about women immigrants with limited English. They suffer even more than women in lo at large because they have a limited idea of where and how to seek help. But yes. we need to care about them anyway, right? Yes. Well, thank you so very much, Irmgard, for sharing your knowledge. And thank you all those who are listening to us for listening, for understanding, and for the upcoming support. Thank you ever so much. Thank you so much for having me, Viona. Let me start our interview about American English with an accent, introducing our honorable guest, Deborah Levine. Hello, Deborah. Hi, Fiona. This is so much I can say about Deborah Levine. And I'm very grateful that she is doing this interview for us. She wears many hats, and she was one of my interviewees for the book, How They Made It in America. She herself is an author of 15 books, a speaker, a blogger, a Forbes magazine, uh, diversity and inclusion trailblazer, and also the editor of American Diversity Report. Her humble immigrant origins, and she came from Bermuda originally, did not deter her, but they stimulated her to becoming total success in the U.S. And she is also expressing her in many books. We'll hear about her success, and also we will listen to her opinions about American English with an accent. Uh, my question to you will be about this. 
diverse dialects. Where do you see yourself on this map as you came from Bermuda to Long Island, New York, then moved to Harvard to study at the university, then lived and worked in Chicago, Cincinnati, Arthur, and now in Chattanooga, Tennessee. What is the place that you maybe feel some belonging in terms of dialects? Good question. And having lived in so many places and adapted to so many dialects, I speak depending on the audience. It's not a matter of trying. My brain and my tongue just mirror what I'm hearing. I see. So you can speak different accents and you do on an as needed basis. That's wonderful. Um, let's move from dialects to accents, a more subtle matter. And by the way, um, dialects are about wording or lexics, while accents are about sounds, pronunciation, and such. This is a map of diverse accents, and only the most important are covered. It's a very simple map. A lot of diversity, as you see. Americans consider themselves very, very lucky if their own accent belongs to top and most prestigious. Well, my accent is not prestigious at all. It is Ukrainian with a touch of New Jersey where I live for 25 years. But you know what? I survived anyway. <laughs> May I ask you, Deborah, which of the American accents is closest to you? Well, thank you for asking. I mostly feel at home uh, with uh, the Southern accent, although not as deeply Southern, say, as Mississippi. So when I first came here, Chattanooga, Tennessee, I was perceived as having been from Virginia. Uh, uh -huh. That is uh, not deep South, but not fully Northern. And yes, they noticed uh, my sort of slight upper class British accent. Uh, that's how my family spoke uh, growing up in Bermuda. Um, and keep in mind that Virginia is where the British landed early in America's history. Yeah, I read about it. I read about it. Now, Deborah, can you recognize some different accents, especially the top three? And how do you recognize them? I would be very interested to listen to this. And our <laughs> audience will be too. Sure. Well, I certainly recognize the Texan accent. Uh -huh. It's uh, southern with a little twist. It's a little more nasal. It has hard R's in it. While the southern accent is softer, with a little lilt. That's more my style. And it's beautiful. Uh, Southerners often uh, will say that Texas is not necessarily the South. That's why you've got country and Western music, you know, and how uh -huh. usually ends up as, as Western. Yeah, and um, how about Bostonian accent? What can you tell about that? So many of my relatives lived in the Boston area for generations, right? And so it's like a second home to me. And uh, uh, speaking like a Bostonian, you know, is one of America's most, they say, sexiest uh -huh. <laughs> accent, which amuses me because I identify it with my grandparents who are not terribly sexy. <laughs> but <clears throat> we do laugh about saying, back your car in Harvard Yard. Uh -huh. You say it as Mac Wahlberg has asked. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and yeah, that's very, very interesting that you can, you can speak it. I hear that. And, and I recognize it. I can't. I recognize this, but I cannot reproduce this accent. No way. Oh. And how about New York accent? Ah, New York, New York. <laughs> uh -huh. An incredibly diverse population, especially since it was the landing place of so many immigrants as they came to America, uh, like 
Italy, Italians, right? And right. That's very recognizable. Uh, but my favorite is the, the Yiddish style. Right? And uh -huh. uh, it, it, uh, it's uh, one of those things where that's been made popular by comedians like, um, oh, you know, Billy Crystal and Mel Brooks, Sarah uh -huh. Silverman and Howard Stern. Uh, and even though I may not be as, as nasal and fast and as ironic as them, it's still deeply in my DNA. I can do it. I, I can do it. I know you can. <laughs> this is so fascinating. Very <laughs> fascinating. Um, I would also like um, to share with our audience something else where we can learn more about the accents. Uh, books with facts and figures, right? Uh, from, from these books, you can learn uh, much more than you can learn from our talk show. The Mini Cup in 2017 and Rosina Lippi Green in 2011. In addition to that, in addition to that, uh, I need to share that I listened very recently to the um, webinar by CETA Europe, Society for Intercultural Education Training and Research. And there was a webinar about accents, cultures, and mentality. Uh, they spoke about accent diminishing and uh, accent uh, intolerance as overlooked bias. What would you make of that? Well, absolutely. There are biases against regional accents as well as international accents. And the accents signify belonging, not only in terms of geography, but other uh -huh. categories like race and ethnicity, history, beliefs, and often uh -huh. gender even. This is how I see it too. I, I also think that this is diminishing somebody um, you, you speak with, uh, that uh, Rosina Lippi Green spoke about it as discrimination on part of the employers, discrimination based on language and accent. And in my experience, language culture ceiling exists. It's invisible, but palpable. For example, um, I can say that um, you cannot really find a woman immigrant, a woman of foreign descent with an accent as a host on major TV networks, which is a pity because such a host would certainly appeal to 60 million Americans who speak English with an accent. Anyway, um, what do you think about it? We are in a historic period when biases are more defined and more deeply felt than in decades. And we need to address the cultures that support such things as language culture ceilings, discrimination, uh -huh. racism, and anti-Semitism here in America. Yes. There is a new spotlight on social justice and while it is a work in progress, for sure, because there are major challenges, this is the time to highlight such efforts for maximum results. Yeah. That would be good. America is not easy, though. Uh, the women I interviewed for the book, like I did yourself, all said that at earlier stages at the migration, their accents diminished their sense of self. But later, you know, they started wearing accents with pride. <laughs> Interesting enough, um, my book subjects, uh, also the books in 40% of cases, um, and these books add a lot to the American culture, like the Dior 15 books. My favorite book of all yours, by the way, is Going Southern, which you gave to me when we first met. What's your favorite book? Well, I love Going Southern too. Going Southern, The No Mess Guide 
to Success in the South. Right. And it was an honor to have C-SPAN Book TV feature the book and interview me. Yes, it was. And it was an honor also to coach international executives coming into the South on how to look at language and sayings and idioms and make the most of their time here, uh, like Volkswagen, right? And it was right. a true pleasure, right, uh, to share that the South has idioms and sayings that are old English, old British, and that's just like I grew up with on the island of Bermuda. How amazing was that? Yeah, yeah, you are right, you are right, I hear you. Uh, Deborah, they say that American attitudes to accents differ from coast to coast, like in the East Coast, in the West Coast, and especially in a liberal Silicon Valley, they are more tolerant of accents, while in the Midwest and in the South, they are less tolerant or, let's say, conservative. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, I have lived or, or worked in just about every region of this country, and the dialects are as diverse as the cultures in those regions, and they're embedded in those cultures. So as a cultural anthropologist, I would say that the sound of our voice is a major factor, right, in determining belonging wherever you go. But, right, the more diverse and cosmopolitan the area, uh -huh. right, they're used to a variety of cultures and accents and dialogues, dialects, and they're much more able to quickly adapt to the fact that there are cultural differences among them. Yeah, and, right. and, they, and they sometimes really enjoy it too. Yes, <laughs> and Deborah, would it be correct to recommend people stop focusing on how people speak Please focus on what they say. Oh, it's always good to focus on what they say and the meaning of what they say. Um, having said that, I know that there are people who are very proud of their accents and don't want to get rid of them and appreciate being appreciated for them, you know. Uh, so these days I use both my very British dialect. Uh -huh. oh, my Yiddish accent more than ever because I no longer feel the need to dispense with them. And people love it. They just love it. Um, let us talk now about um, your own experiences in America and um, um, how you made it in America, how you became your own woman regardless of your accent. All right, now, um, let me ask you this. Uh, what is most important for success in the U.S. in your experience? Cultural integration or language or accent correction or education, whatever. What's your feeling? Well, education has meant everything to me. When I first came to this country, I really didn't like it. Huh. I learned to take advantage of all that it has to offer by studying. Uh -huh. It's literature and computer programming. I learned to play the violin, learned to dance ballet, and I got advanced degrees in arts administration, uh, Jewish studies, cultural anthropology, and urban planning. I've been very fortunate and nothing has gone to waste and you pull it all together and it has enabled me to overcome amazing things from when I was young and uh -huh. bullied because I had a British accent on the schoolyard uh, yeah. to today when I've been targeted by neo-Nazis for my present work. Uh-huh. Thank you. Uh, speaking figuratively, how did you find your own voice in this country as a professional? Could you put it in a nutshell, please? I'll try. So my unusual background has led to unusual opportunities. And sometimes uh, the opportunities were hidden. They looked more like crises. For example, coming to America as a kid, 
I had no immunity to the common childhood illnesses here and spent weeks in bed with little to keep me company except my books and my diary. Ah. But reading and writing became the gifts that never stopped giving. Mm -hmm. And I started publishing my stories as a teenager and kept on going. Newsletters, blogs, and opinion columns, and books, all with a cultural diversity underpinning. Uh -huh. I saw writing uh, as uh, anything more than a, a filler to my executive positions in nonprofits and Jewish federations. Right. That is until about 15 years ago when I created the American Diversity Report.com. Uh -huh. My voice became internationally known. And I want to thank all the angels who saw my potential early on and helped and nudged and sometimes shoved me into the limelight. It's been an amazing journey. Thank you. How nicely you put it in your own words of gratitude. Angels who saw my potential and helped. Yeah. Let me tell you that I know Deborah for many years. I researched her and interviewed her. I can attest to everything she says. Thank you so much, Deborah, for coming here. Yours is an amazing story, a lesson for me and for our audience as well, I'm sure. A round of applause for Deborah, please. Oh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Um, let us do summary now. From our today's discussion, I understand that facts and figures point to a condescending attitude towards immigrants based in part on their not-too-perfect English and accent. But women are on the rise anyway, and some of them speak American English with different accents, either regional or foreign or whatever. I would like to recommend that your takeaways from today's talk show are, one, speak American English with confidence. Accent is irrelevant in most professions. Two, Follow women who made it big in America, despite being immigrants with accents. And three, and most importantly, the last but not the least, order the book by Fiona Sitkin, me, how they made it in America to learn more and grow to be your own best. Um, at the end, I would like to thank you for listening, for understanding, and invite you to connect, first of all, on YouTube, where you can see all the episodes of The Bridge for Women Worldwide. You can subscribe and get all of our shows, and you can also write what you think and write any questions under discussion on the YouTube set, um, channel. You can also write to me in private, fiona.sitkin at gmail.com. Ask me anything. I guarantee that I will answer. And we can also connect when you go to my website, uh, fionasitkin.com. There you can see more pictures, more about myself, more about my books. You can see my blogs, webinars, and whatnot. I welcome you. I will be happy to see you. Bye-bye, and I hope to see you again.